Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, part of the Marine Protected Area Center webinar series sponsored by NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center and OCTO. I'm Zach Canizzo with NOAA's National Marine Protected Area Center, and I will be your moderator today. We're very excited for today's webinar titled Planning for Coastal and Marine Heritage in a Changing Climate and presented by Dr. Aaron Seacamp. Aaron Seacamp is a professor in the Department of Natural Resources at North Carolina State University. Her research focuses on conservation behaviors, partnerships, and community capacity building within the human dimensions of natural resource management and sustainable tourism fields. Dr. Seacamp's research program is currently focused on building community climate readiness in coastal communities, as well as understanding adaptive planning options for managing cultural resources vulnerable to sea level rise and shoreline erosion. We're very excited to have her here today. Before I turn it over to Dr. Seacamp, I would like to let you know that we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation as they occur to you. Please type your questions in the question box, which is found at the bottom of your control panel, which is often found on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will pose those questions to Dr. Seacamp at the end of the presentation. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Seacamp. Great, thanks so much, Zach, and thank you all for joining me today. So again, the title of my talk is Planning for Coastal and Marine Heritage in a Changing Climate. And what's um, interesting about this um, image here is, is just showing you some storm frequency flooding elevations and um, the most recent storm at Cape Lookout National Seashore, and that's where this um, historic building is located, is Hurricane Dorian. And you can see that it's even above where it's written on the door that says high water marks. And I'll be showing a few images from the impacts there um, throughout this presentation. All right, so just a little overview. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is heritage and heritage present preservation as well as um, heritage preservation and related to climate change. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about this idea of accommodating for a loss and enabling transformation, as well as talking about adaptation planning for historic buildings in particular um, and providing a study that has been conducted at Cape Lookout National Seashore as an example. So what is heritage? So it is inherited traditions objects, monuments, landscapes, and seascapes. And it is made up of ecosystems, so both the natural and the cultural resources within an area. And oftentimes people isolate nature from culture, but they're integrated and other materials may um, be within those landscapes. They could be archeological materials or structures or monuments, but all of these things together bring us our cultural co connections and help create our own identities. And there's also other societal benefits, including um, tourism revenue generation for communities um, that are affiliated with them. Um, and thinking about heritage preservation itself, um, the idea behind heritage preservation is to preserve, conserve, and protect buildings, objects, landscapes, or other artifacts of historical or cultural significance. And it's that word significance that's really important to think about um, when we have things that we consider to be or could potentially be significant, they're listed or eligible for a listing on the National Register of Historic Places, which was designated through the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. And the National Register is managed by the National Park Service. And the way in which it defines significance is affiliated with two components. One is association and the other is integrity. And so to have something be considered significant, it needs to have association to a person, event, or distinct characteristics to type, period, or method of construction, and that includes artistic value. In terms of integrity, there's something about the location in which something's set, the setting around that location, the design of whatever it is that is um, under consideration, whether it be a building or an, a form of art, some the materials, the workmanship, the feeling that that object or building or place evokes and its association to those persons, events, distinct characters, characteristic type to period or method of construction. So we think about the National Park Service itself and climate change and, and related to heritage management. 
um, several years ago now, um, a study was conducted that demonstrated that over $20 billion of coastal assets were at high risk to sea level rise and coastal flooding and erosion impacts. Now, not all of the coastal assets are considered heritage. Some of them could be roads, um, it could be communications and electrical um, infrastructure. So there's other things that are there or non-historic um, properties as well. But the things that are of concern related to sea level rise and um, increased storm surge and flooding is that heritage itself could become submerged, it could be inundated, it could become saturated, it could have dissolution where it's losing parts of its properties or corrosion, which is pretty similar, and then erosion could also wash things away. But when it comes to thinking about how to manage for heritage in a changing climate, there's a lot of uncertainties and constraints as well that are facing agencies like the National Park Service. So one of those is that the climate change impacts themselves. There's a lot of unknowns related to the timing of those impacts and how severe they may be. The other key uncertainty here is that when we're talking about coastal and marine environments, they're coupled with dynamic systems. So they're already in flux and changing. We also know that um, there's political projects um, or pet projects and administrative priorities that can determine what actually is preserved um, or how things are done. So back when the Cape Look or sorry, when the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was moved nearly a mile inshore to um, avoid the erosion that was occurring to the beaches at Cape Hatteras National Seashore, and it was a rider on an on a appropriations bill. And determining which buildings are restored or are left to deteriorate when there's fiscal constraints um, that have left to the, a lot of places with deferred maintenance. Um, it is becoming administrators prerogative to determine which buildings to attend to or which resources to attend to. And when you're thinking about cultural resources, it competes directly with natural resource programs, things like invasive species or and um, no, not invasive species. I mean, it could, uh, but what I was thinking more of was like threatened and endangered species and the money that's needed to ensure the longevity of biodiversity. And then thinking about how management directives come um, to agencies, they could come in the form of policy memos, like the one that was put forward by then director John Jarvis in 2014, it was policy memo 1402, that directed cultural resource management in the National Park Service for decisions and funding to make it to ensure that they consider not just those that are significant, but also the resources that are most vulnerable. And that's where attention should be given. But when we start thinking about heritage management and heritage preservation, we need to think a little bit more about the time in which those decisions are made and those designation decisions. Um, occur when a cultural landscape is typically in what um, folks consider to be an intact system. And so it looks one way and we're designating that as the period of time or a point in time which we want to ensure continuity into the future that it remains the same. But within those cultural landscapes, we have tangible heritage, so those could be the buildings or monuments. The cultural relationships, that's an intangible um, the intangible components of that um, landscape, it could be the traditions that occur that, and both the tangible and intangible heritages create those cultural relationships that people are dependent upon within those places, as well as the additional societal benefits that they provide. When a disturbance happens, those things become pulled apart and they look a little bit different and they may reorganize in different ways into the future. And so in heritage, there's this idea of continuity of values, and it recognizes that there's a continual process of evolving tangible and intangible heritage expressions in response to changing circumstances. And in this sense, change is embraced to be part of the continuity. However, there, the preservationist paradigm sort of ignores that idea that change occurs. It's more about trying to maintain that intact system or that intact resources at the point in which it was designated. And so when we start thinking about climate change with continuity and change, 
We want to think about the values and this idea of significance. And so again, you have something designated as being significant within the heritage system. Climate change could be impacting what was deemed as significant about it and changing whether or not it should remain on something like the National Register. But adaptation strategies can have that same effect as well. It can influence what is valued and what is significant about a heritage resource. So take, for example, again, the Cape Hatteras um, Lighthouse. So again, it was moved about a mile inland. As you see, the shoreline was eroding and they were trying to stabilize uh, that beach and it was still um, becoming jeopardized by how close the, the high tides and shore were um, to the light station base itself. And so when you move it, you change its context, you change its settings. And some may argue that it changes the feeling that you're supposed to have. Therefore, those things are all affiliated with the integrity of that resource. And so we need to be thinking about that adaptation strategies, including things like moving a lighthouse, are gonna have some consequences. When we think about all of the lighthouses along the seaboards of the United States, is it gonna be possible to preserve them all? How are we gonna determine which ones are more significant than others and what's worthy of preservation? So we think about this idea of determining what's worthy of protection or listing on the National Register. These are really value-laden decisions. The National Park Service, State Historic Preservation Offices, Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, other heritage experts and community stakeholders, particularly those associated communities that have treaty rights that um, are lands that were um, ancestral properties. And so there's a lot of different people who have a lot of different opinions on how this should, um, these decisions should be made. And we need to recognize and acknowledge that those differences um, have different levels of priority and consideration. You start thinking about which, which treatments, again, it's gonna be thinking about the significance, the current condition of the resource itself, the proposed use that may happen there, as well as the intended interpretation. When I talk about treatments, the Park Service thinks about preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, and reconstruction as different types of treatments for historic preservation. Now, there's different types of adaptation treatments that could um, be applied as well, including letting things go and acknowledging that loss is something that's acceptable. But how do we determine which adaptation actions, whether it might be moving a lighthouse or actually letting the lighthouse fall into the sea, should we be thinking about? So this um, has brought me to a lot of thinking on the term of resilience, um, which originally comes from engineering fields. You think about it a ball in a cup as a system gets disturbed and impacted that state in which something was designated as um, significant, it starts to move and that resource could be in danger of losing what values it had in determining its significance. And so when we think about the preservation paradigm, we constantly want to think about bringing it back to that static state at the bottom of that cup where those um, values and significance are the same as they were before. So in that place, in, in that kind of thinking, we think about adaptation as persistence, but there's some concerns with this idea of adaptation only being perceived as persistence. And to give an example that probably is readily available to most people, the city of Venice, that there's rigidity within the system of thinking about the preservation paradigm um, and trying to continually bring things back. Venice regularly experiences high tides, um, high tide events, and is threatened by sea level rise. In 2009, there were actually 25 exceptional high tides, which are over 110 centimeters, so over three feet in height. Um, the highest one in 2019 was um, just over six feet um, and just under the 1966 historic flooding event and it created $5.5 million of um, damage to St. Mark's Basilica. So this occurs over and over again. And so the idea is we continue to restore these places to where they are. They draw in lots of tourists, even when St. Mark's Square is completely flooded. 
and there has to be these walkways that are erected. But is this the way to be thinking about how to move forward? What, uh, what kinds of adaptation options are available to the city of Venice when we're talking about an entire city with a culture that's known globally? So you think about offsite adaptation is the key strategy that's being implemented in that city. And so thinking about engineering solutions to ensure that as those high tides are projected, these floodgates can be erected that keep those tides at bay and keep the water out of the lagoons. It costs $7 billion, so it's obviously not going to be something that all cities can afford and all heritage resources um, will be able to secure that level of funding. It was a, a, a large um, EU effort um, to, to pull that together. It started in 2003. Um, it took far more years than anticipated to complete. And it's been determined that it's really, it's. Um, ability to work is dependent on the accuracy of those forecasts. So there was an event um, that wasn't forecasted to be at a place where the floodgates should rise. And so there, there was damage again in Venice due to that. Um, every time those floodgates are lifted, it costs about $330,000 million or $330, um, in terms of costs. It also creates a lot of shipping delays. And so we think about adaptation. Um, we, all, we need to recognize that it's a blind process that can only be viewed as rational in hindsight. Right now, it, this seems to be working. How about 20 years from now? Will those floodgates be so corroded that they don't work, especially as the sea level rise and as projections are gonna be a lot greater than they were projected back when construction began in 2003? We often, too, with adaptation, have a bias towards using technology to do it and downplay an ongoing process of autonomous adaptation at the local level. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to talk about today is that autonomous adaptation. So what I want to be thinking about is how we can rethink about this concept of resilience um, and use the ecological model of resilience as a way to think about how to better enhance heritage preservation. And so that's a transformational paradigm. Rather than thinking about heritage as something we need to preserve, we can think about heritage as something that actually can be transformed and adaptation as a way to allow for those transitions to occur and so what we're actually transforming is where that significance is held, maybe from tangible to intangible heritage qualities within a landscape. So thinking about different types of adaptation, there's that persistent adaptation, right? We want to preserve or restore something in place with historic um, materials or maybe with more resistant materials. And so we're thinking about continuity of those heritage values in a static state. So we think about allowing for transformation, we can be thinking a little bit more about anticipatory adaptation where we're planning for changes and accommodate um, those types of changes. So we might elevate a building or relocate it. And so we're starting to think then about continuity through planned change. Or there's that idea of autonomous adaptation. And so you enable those transition and values to other parts of the landscape. And so the continuities through changing what is valued in any of this, any adaptation strategy that's selected, it's really critical that communities are engaged and not just heritage preservation experts who are brought in from the outside to do this work. It is the people whose heritages they are who understand how that change will affect the place meanings that are held there and their identities and their dependencies on these landscapes. So what I've been thinking about is how you have these intact systems, you get a disturbed system, and then there's this new system of it where things are kind of pulled apart, but then there's going to be a future system where we rethink about what that cultural landscape looks like. And so I want to be sure that I'm clear in saying that persistent adaptation is not a bad thing. There is innovation in it. It enables revitalization. There are things we want to hold on to from our past in the way that they um, were at the time in which they were deemed as significant. But there's also the ability to have 
innovation in transition as well through those anticipatory and autonomous adaptation strategies. So again, how do we accommodate for loss? What is loss? And so I think we, what we need to be thinking a little bit more about is this idea of transformative continuity is the whole range of adaptation um, that is occurring. So when impacts happen and we restore something or preserve it back to some way through persistent adaptation, we are still changing it. And we need to recognize that there's change inherent in that. And that that may be okay, like those new resilient materials that are used to enhance the ability for something to be retained within a landscape or seascape in which it's located. I also think there's a memory moment when a system becomes disturbed. And at that point, we need to perhaps keep something in its ruined state so that we can educate and discuss the fragility of different ecosystems at different points in times and those dynamic processes that will then likely help us be able to be more creative and thinking about adaptation strategies into the, into the future when we recognize the inherent risks within our own land and seascapes. And moving forward into the future systems, this is our ability to discover what might be something we hadn't even conceptualized before. So as things become submerged, maybe we want to leave them in that submerged state so that they could be discovered by future generations and be thought of in a different way. We think about the lost city of Atlantis. Everybody wants to discover it, right? But we can also remember what has been there in the past. So the idea that I put forward with a colleague of mine is this idea of transformative continuity. It's the ability to carry forth aspects of cultural landscapes or seascapes, um, regardless of whether or not they are restored through persistent adaptation, or if they are rearranged through anticipatory or autonomous adaptation into a new cultural landscape or seascape following disturbances. So I wanna kind of make a little bit of this a more, um, concrete in your minds. And I'm going to bring you to Cape Lookout National Seashore, where I have been um, collaborating with lots of different folks out there and uh, different researchers um, thinking about how to adapt and prioritize the adaptation actions for buildings within two historic districts out at Cape Lookout National Seashore. So these are images of some of the um, already receding floodwaters following Hurricane Dorian when it was safe enough to be able to go and inventory Portsmouth Village um, following the event. So there's two different historic villages. There's Portsmouth Village at the very north end and at the very southern end of the shore, seashore is Cape Lookout Village. And if you're not familiar with where this is located, it's in Eastern North Carolina. And so the question that we were charged with trying to figure out how to answer is how do we protect vulnerable buildings located in these historic districts? So they're listed on the National Register, therefore significant in the face of climate change. Now, one of the things that's important to consider is looking at these Outer Bank Islands. They are very vulnerable to sea level rise, to storm surge, flooding and erosion. And so what happens if you have an entire district that is marked as significant, so all of the buildings within it are significant and they're all vulnerable? How do you start making prioritization decisions when those things are, are similar? So we had to come up with some decision criteria. One was gonna be on the cost to ensure that there was efficiencies um, that were being considered. So the return on investment, would it last? How long would it? How long would something remain on the landscape? We need to think about the projected vulnerabilities as well. So we were thinking out into the future. We again wanted to think about persistence on the landscape. How can we retain as much significance on this landscape as possible? But how do we measure what that significance is? We had to ask the questions like, who is it significant to? How do you measure that? And how do adaptation strategies change significance as well as the ability for something to persist in a vulnerable landscape? 
And so what we wanted to do was integrate diverse values through a co-production of knowledge approach where we brought together different individuals to help us answer some of these questions. So we brought together um, National Park Service staff from the Washington office, from regional offices, and from local parks. We also brought in the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office staff. And we brought in representatives from partner organizations who have um, direct ties and lineages to both of these historic villages. And then other local preservation professionals who are also grappling with similar types of decisions, but that may not have the same types of um, regulations and policies as the National Park Service does. So the co-production of process was iterative. We, we met for a week and then had individual meetings, did some online elicitations, and again, had more meetings, brought everybody back together again, repeat, repeat, until we got to a place where we thought we um, had a model that we could work with. So the first question was how to prioritize among significant buildings. So you've got two life-saving stations, one in each, um, historic district. So you have the Portsmouth Village Life Saving Station um, on the left of your screen here. You can see it's very proximate to the shoreline. Um, it's in relatively good condition. And you can actually go inside and there's um, historic replicas of boats and things like that inside to understand what it was like to live on the edge of the sea and try to um, help many of the shipwrecks and the individuals that were on those boats. And on the right side of your screen, you can see the one at Cape Lookout Village. Now that life-saving station has been moved from its original context. It's also been added onto as different people occupied it prior to the state of North Carolina, gaining ownership of the land and transferring it to the National Park Service. And there are leases on both of these properties. And so um, the one in the Southern has, has changed more dramatically than the one in the, the North in Portsmouth Village. So we created a way to measure different attributes of significance, but we also found out through these conversations that considering the, the uses of these buildings is also important in thinking about whether or not to invest in them. So do they help park operations? Are they used for offices or storage? Can visitors access these buildings? Is there interpretive um, components to it? Do they um, lead to the maritime history of the shoreline? Could they be used for, and are they in use for third parties? So could a concessionaire possibly use it to rent out lodging? And what is the scientific potential of information within them? Do they have scientific uses in terms of design and construction in vulnerable locations? And then thinking about significance, you can see we have that association um, attribute there, as well as the condition of the building the character, whether or not it's one of the primary reasons that the district was formed, that the village was there, and whether it's listed on the National Register or eligible for the National Register. And so you can see we were able to um, use some weights so that some um, aspects are more important than other and create scores for each of them, and that the Portsmouth Village Life Saving Station was ranked as more significant than those the or would have greater priority for adaptation um, than the Cape Lookout Village um, Life Saving Station. The numbers in red are where the key differences come into, which is related to the character and the fact that one's open and the other is not open for visitor use. Well, we took all of that information with historical significance and use protection or use potential and called it a building's resource value. And then we took that value and looked at the vulnerability of that building now and in 30 years from now to get a, to uh, a total resource value score for each building. And then as actions or no actions are applied to buildings, it either increases or detracts from the historical significance and the use potential, as well as enhancing or detracting from the vulnerability of that building. And so we were looked at this 30 year planning horizon and what you can see on the right where the large orange box are with other colored boxes is patterns of actions, depending on how much money is available annual, annually to be applied to these buildings. And so sometimes no actions occur, so you can borrow money from one building to pay for a higher cost adaptation action for another one. 
And so the idea is to think about different types of funding strategies and what that would look like in terms of persistence on the landscape, as well as budget efficiencies, which you see through that graph on the bottom left side of your screen, where you're looking at the accumulated resource value scores is that dotted line. And what you're trying to figure out is, is how much do you need to invest annually to maintain or enhance that score? Yet, despite the fact that we went through this and had very complicated um, algorithms and modeling efforts, um, we also recognized that the people in the room who um, helped us develop that model weren't necessarily the direct descendants and former residents of those buildings. So we wanted to think about what, is, what do other stakeholders think about adaptation of these places and so stakeholders are people who can be impacted by decisions because of the meanings that the places hold for them. For a national park site, it could be citizens of tribal nations, it could be community members, it could be members of partner organizations, and it could be visitors. And so again, we wanna think about this idea of place meanings and place meanings are made up of these place identities and dependencies that could be related to an individual, a family, or at a community level. So we conducted interviews with descendants from um, former residents of these buildings to try to understand how their place meanings were related to their heritage values. And what we found was that their heritage values predominantly represented intangible values and they weren't the buildings themselves, with the exception of the lighthouse, but in further digging with the, the Cape Lookout Lighthouse, it really represents something that's intangible. It's a symbol of home for them. And then asking them what they think the threats to heritage are. Is it climate change? Well, it is inevitably going to be climate impacts. They believe that. Some people even said they were the first climate migrants when they left Diamond City, which was on another bank after a great um, storm destroyed many of the structures at the turn of the 1900s. Um, but there are more urgent concerns that came up. One of them is that the community itself is aging and they're very concerned that they're not going to have the ability to create these types of ties for future generations. They don't all understand the meaning of these places. There's also a lot of concern with deferred maintenance, which they think about as neglect. But as you can see in this quote here, adaptation actions really are important to these individuals. Thinking about the Portsmouth church on stilts or moving it somewhere off island, that the church itself would lose its soul. So when we start thinking about the impacts to place meanings, it, we find that those place connections are really to the intangible cultural resources and that place meanings remain mostly intact um, dis despite um, whether or not loss occurs. There would be a sense of sadness and a feeling of loss if the buildings weren't there, but people are more connected to the memories and the intangible values that the place represents. The loss of meaning, a lot of it actually had already occurred with the land acquisition by the state of North Carolina when homes were transferred or when the 30-year or lifetime leases had expired. And so they had already, these, this community of people had already grieved some of the loss of these buildings. When we asked them about preferences for adaptation strategies, they really wanted to focus on short-term maintenance to improve the structural integrity for newer storms. As you could see before with those threats, they're still concerned that weather events are gonna be impacting these buildings. And so they wanna make sure that they can withstand them. But the question that still remains is for how long? How long do you continue to invest right now? Another preference would be for structural or engineered solutions. Um, there's some potential for, for beach nourishment, although the National Park Service itself tries to avoid that as an option due to their preference for natural processes. Uh, moving or elevating structures, we found took something away from them, but there is some support for adaptive reuse. So that idea of a third party party, a third party coming in and utilizing that building so that it's in use and can be maintained and into the future. But overwhelmingly, there was a, a lot of interest in interpretation and documentation. 
knowing that these buildings aren't going to be there forever into perpetuity, they want to think about different ways for future generations to learn about that heritage because they do think that the, one of the only solutions is that nature will take its course. When we asked about suggestions for prioritization, there was structure-based prioritization suggestion where you think about the condition, the, whether it needs to be um, enhanced at this time and how much previous investments had already gone into a particular structure. But that was probably the least um, important type of prioritization suggestion. More likely, they were interested in value-based prioritization. What is the cultural value of the building to the community? What's its historical significance to the nation? And what are the traditional uses of the banks themselves? How is it related to that? So they think as a, as a tradition of uh, fishing and hunting. And then the one that had the most um, preference was for a collaborative prioritization where communities were involved, they were consulted, they could help do fundraising, they could help with some of the work itself so that there could be more of a focus on local culture into the future. So some general conclusions from this work that I've been conducting and the thoughts that I've been having um, is that historical significance can be measurable and prioritization is possible. However, you need to bring different people together because these are value-based decisions and value-based thinking. There's lots of different types of individuals and stakeholders who should be in the room. We need to have frameworks that are flexible to changing values. As our values change, we need to reevaluate those frameworks as impacts are realized. They also need to be updated and regularly assessed as well as when adaptation strategies are implemented so they can be responsive to whether or not they worked and how things changed afterwards. Well, as I wanna think about climate adaptation itself, it really requires a holistic approach that doesn't separate materials or nature from people. Values inform decisions, cultural values are embedded in the landscapes and seascapes and identities are shaped by place meanings. Also, tangible heritage values can transform into intangible values, like the symbol of home that the lighthouse represents, and that you can see small representations of the lighthouse around the community off the island. That even if the lighthouse isn't standing, it will continue to be a symbol of home. That intangible values then create place meanings, and place meanings do inform management preferences. And that community members' place connections can be affected by climate impacts, but they're also impacted by adaptation actions or even perceptions of neglect. And ultimately, um, the key take home message here is that collaborations with communities is necessary because it allows for this idea of transformation and not just preservation to enable the persistence of significance as well as its transformation through persistent anticipatory or autonomous adaptation. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Seacamp, for an incredibly interesting presentation. Definitely a lot of food for thought there and some really, really awesome and powerful examples. So if anyone does have any questions, please remember to type them into the question box and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, we do have one question that was entered earlier, which asks, would stories be an example of intangible heritage? Definitely, yes. Stories, storytelling, um, our intangible heritages, our traditions as well. So dance could also be considered an example of that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, wait, I don't see any other questions up. There we go, now they're starting to come in. Um, someone wondering if you have done any similar work for archeological sites in addition to the built environment. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm currently um, working on this work related to archeological site adaptation planning with the National Park Service. And last week I was just um, out in Montana and working 
um, with a partner who is the director of the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribes um, Tribal Historic Preservation Department. His name is Mike Durklow. And so we're trying to figure out how um, to integrate traditional knowledges into frameworks like this um, where that are mostly based off of, of Western science, right? And so how can we help with engaging tribal communities in, in the planning process and not just at the decision-making time when it comes to consultation? Great, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about some of that work and how you do work with uh, engaging with tribal communities and indigenous communities in incorporating their traditional knowledge and throughout the process? Yeah, I mean, we're, it's ongoing right now. So um, some of what we're, we're trying to do is hold conversations where we um, talk about what Western science would think are um, the vulnerabilities to archeological sites, which we've recognized are, are not um, typically called that by traditional communities and indigenous communities. They're traditional use areas and artifacts are ancestral objects. And so what we have done in Western science is pretty much dehumanize the field of archeology span um, and remove people from it. And so one of the ways of integrating traditional knowledges and working with tribal communities is to develop a shared understanding and, uh, of terminology and of the place of people within landscapes and that our reductionist tendencies aren't actually aligned with more of that holism that comes through traditional knowledge. Great, thank you. Another question comment we have is we are working on a community survey to help prioritize work in an area in an area of Florida. Have you done or do you know of other groups that have administered a survey to descendant communities and residents also working with a local fishing community? And they also note that they love the story and conversations you are having. Yeah, so the work that I've, I have conducted, um, so I just shared one piece of our stakeholder engagement process with those um, resources at Cape Lookout. We conducted an on-site visitor survey to understand visitor perspectives of climate change threats and preferences for adaptation. We conducted online surveys with the members of both of the partner organizations. Um, and we also conducted an online um, I'm not really sure what to call it. We'll call it just a, a survey, but it was a little bit more than that. Um, it had some GIS involved in it and some future casting and asked and to see if we could get experts' opinions from a way who weren't familiar with the site to see what they thought were the um, preferred types of adaptation actions um, and which buildings should be uh, considered to that should not be considered for adaptation. Thank you. Uh, another question we have is, are there any examples of taking movies, moving through buildings and sites to record them in three dimensions so that they can be experienced as a virtual experience before the structures degrade or disappear? Yes, that's the short answer. Yes, I can't name any off the top of my head, but um, this current superintendent at Cape Lookout National Seashore, his name's Jeff West. Um, he is working on developing that with um, some other partners. Um, not with me, so I don't have the specifics on it, but one of the things that they want to be doing is using um, 3D technologies and um, gigapan photography to be able to, to show what the landscape looks like now, to go into the buildings and to enable transition to occur and transformation of those values into um, more of that digital space so that it is um, accessible for future generations, even if the buildings aren't there currently. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come in is wondering whether or not there are any grants, organizations, money otherwise out there to help with moving buildings that are privately owned but may not be historic or on the historic register. Oh, that's a good question. And I'm not sure. I would contact your local planning department to, to find out um, what they may have um, available to them. I do think that um, as we see more events occurring and as um, private property is more and more vulnerable, uh, my guess is that, that FEMA may have some kind of a program for that into the future. 
Thank you. Another question we've had come in says, it seems like much of your research found that these properties are eligible as traditional cultural properties. Has there been any interest or discussion in updating these national register nominations to address their traditional cultural property value? Hmm. That's a great question. And I have not been engaged in those discussions um, and I don't know if they're occurring. We are um, hoping to secure some more funding. So the funding for um, the project at Cape Lookout National Seashore came from the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is Department of Interior USGS, as well as the National Park Service Climate Change Response Program. And so we have some, we have a proposal in with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center to revisit what we um, had done before to integrate more um, cultural um, perspectives into the modeling effort itself and um, just look at what's changed since the impacts of Dorian, including some of the um, pretty innovative adaptation strategies that the superintendent has been applying on the landscape as he consults with local communities. But that's a great question and I don't have the answer for you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question asking if you have any thoughts on how to manage coastal prehistoric sites that will be eroded due to rising sea level resulting from climate change. Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is to determine whether or not there's living associated communities with those sites and to, to work with those communities themselves, um, their tribal historic preservation officers. Um, so some of what I've been hearing, we've been holding listening sessions um, across the nation and um, you know, every tribe has, has different values, but many coastal tribes believe that, um, that loss is, is acceptable and that oftentimes nothing should be done. Documentation may be the preference, um, including um, 3D imaging of sites before they are lost. Again, it's going to be about how do we prioritize which ones to invest in that kind of um, work initially um, before more losses occur. Some of what we also heard is that, you know, there's many underwater submerged sites already. And so it's just part of the process that climate change is also um, prophecy and it's, it's going to happen. Thank you. As a follow up to that, they, they ask, um, what about sites that do not necessarily relate to current communities? In particular, they're referring to early Holocene sites. Do you have thoughts on that in particular? So I think I really don't have um, a good suggestion on, on where to start with that. Um, in all honesty, I work with people. I'm a social scientist, so um, I try to ensure that um, those people who have those relationships to that, that place um, have an understanding. And so when we think about archaeological sites, there's usually layered histories of occupation. And so maybe, again, going back to what is the most closely affiliated living community um, that has the longest um, ancestry to that landscape and involve them in that conversation. Whether or not they want to be involved in it is, is going to be their prerogative. And if they choose not to, then to think about the communities that live nearby, as well as the scientific community about what we can learn from that site, should it be excavated or should it be archived or should nothing occur. Thank you. Uh, another question of interest is, how do you or would you recommend handling cultural resource information that should not be made public, but should be considered in decisions? Um, it didn't necessarily name anything, but I'm thinking of perhaps sites that could be in danger of damage or looting if their location is made public. Yeah, so this is a huge, one of the things that we're trying to um, think about with our the, the current phase of the project that we're working on with archeological sites is that, it's more likely that um, changes are going to be impacted and whatever kind of prioritization framework we can develop would be utilized when exposures occur and materials are um, have become to the surface and to where to go to avoid looting first, right? Where do we direct our attention first in, in those situations? Um, I do think that we need to be very, very conscious of um, protecting the um, location of sites, um, but we also need to recognize that as they become exposed, if they're nearby um, development, including trails, that they're likely to be, um, there's that potential for looting and that 
working in collaboration um, and public archaeology, working with um, tribes as ones who do assessment and monitoring. Um, there's a lot of options into the future. Great, thank you. Uh, question here asking if you're familiar with the concept of panarchy from Gunderson and Holling, and if so, if you can comment on how the cycle of reorganization and exploitation fits into your ideas of transformative persistence or vice versa, and I would ask if you are familiar with that concept, if you could briefly describe what it is, because I know I'm not. Sure. So panarchy is a cycle that everything goes through these, these moments of um, disturbance and reorganization and transition. And so it, it's in the symbol of an infinity. And so we keep moving through these cycles and they happen over and over again. But there's times in which disturbances happens where we exit out of that cycle and we go into a new system and have, a it, it begins a new cycle of that. And we can think about that um, in different levels too. It's also thinking about like political hierarchy in, in different levels as well um, of those cycles. So there's lots of different ways to conceptualize it. I would probably need another hour to go into explaining it more clearly, um, but I, I definitely was thinking about it when I was working on this idea of transformative continuity. And I think it's, um, it is both in that reorganization within the cycle as well as the exiting out and going into a new or a new system. Great, thank you. Great explanation as well. Uh, as a note to the audience, we have one question left up here. So if you do have any questions you might have been sitting on thinking that we might not get to them, please feel free to put them in the question box as we do have about eight minutes left. So that last question that we currently have submitted is, can you give an example of strategies you can use for a local community that has differing views on the best way to preserve a site? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that that you can do is um, bring people together, have a conversation about them, try to focus that conversation about what they value about the site, not about um, necessarily the specific materials or organization of it, but why it's meaningful to them, how they're connected to it, so that people tend to come together and acknowledge each other's values rather than um, fight over specifics. Um, and so if you can get people starting about what is, what's meaningful to them and get them to hear each other, then I think most conversations can be a bit more productive in that way. And then as you trans, as you find out where people are at that point, you can, you can take some measurements of, of support for different types of strategies, right? You can, um, use audience polling techniques, which now you know are readily available to just about anybody with a, a cell phone, so you can even do it in a workshop setting. And you can have live updates through that through the type of technology to show the community members where consensus is and where um, differences of opinion exist. Thank you. We do have another question that's come in. They say they're sorry if they missed it, but they're wondering what tribe you are currently working with. If so you're able the, to give that information. Uh, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribe um, currently working with the Tribal Historic Preservation Department Director. His name's Mike Durklow, Jr. Thank you. We don't have any other questions that have come in right now, so I'll give everyone another chance to submit any last minute questions you might have. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting to see if anything else comes in, I want to say thank you to Dr. Seacamp for an outstanding presentation, and thank you to the audience for great engagement. We had a really good discussion here, and um, thank you again, Dr. Seacamp, for a great presentation. We're getting lots of thank yous flooding in, no questions yet, but a number of people saying thank you for a great presentation. So with that, as I'm not seeing any other questions, uh, we will go ahead and end today's webinar. Thank you all again. Thank you.